There are opportunities in life of which one just has to take advantage. And for me, one was taking a Marian spirituality course at a Catholic university this summer. As I shared in a reflection earlier this year, the pandemic has provided me with the opportunity to enroll in a graduate certificate course in spiritual direction, a ministry I have long felt called to. And I've been taking courses in the Christian spirituality program at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. This program was recommended to me by my professor at Yale Divinity School when I asked her for a list of programs for training to be a spiritual director when the timing was right. Usually this program includes five week residential study for three summers, which would basically be impossible to arrange in my future as a parish priest, no matter whether it was the best program of its kind or not. Due to the pandemic though, like so much of our lives, it was moved fully online. And as I shared in that other reflection, I jumped at the opportunity to apply to this program and everything else fell into place. Truly, it's been an unexpected blessing in these most difficult of times. A course in Marian spirituality is not required in the program, but I was intrigued when I saw a two week intensive on Mary being offered. I, as a female Episcopal priest, would have the opportunity to study in depth one of the most controversial figures of the English Reformation and to do so from a Catholic perspective, nonetheless. It was an opportunity of ecumenical dialogue and learning that I just didn't want to let pass by. As a person raised in the Quaker and congregational churches, Mary had a pretty limited time in the limelight. She was mentioned in Advent on the third Sunday, like today, and of course, she is in the manger with Jesus and Joseph on Christmas. It wasn't until seminary, though, that I came to understand what an incredible, courageous role model Mary is. Her ability and all her humble humanity to say yes to God's grand invitation is breathtaking. She has inspired me at key moments in my life to say yes to something good and holy that God was calling me to and to not let fear or doubt hold me back. You might say I wouldn't be here before you this evening on the anniversary of my ordination to the priesthood without sharing some of Mary's faithful, adventuresome spirit. My interest in Mary further deepened, sparked, I confess, by romantic interest in the devout Roman Catholic man who is now my husband. One of the first more in-depth conversations we had included him asking me, what do you believe about Mary? This question came in sequence of several theological questions. And by this point, I had caught on that he was going through the theological claims of the Nicene Creed, one of the ancient foundational documents of the church. And I said to Jonathan, you do know that Episcopalians say the Nicene Creed is a standard part of our liturgy, right? And then I said, I'm still getting to know Mary though. And this is true to this day. When I returned to seminary for the next term, like all other postulants for the priesthood in the Episcopal Church, I took a course in the historical foundations of Anglican theology. I learned about the many power struggles and debates of the English Reformation, how practices such as what clothing priests would wear during worship, whether there would be candles on the altar, whether music would be a part of worship, what prayers would be said in the Eucharist, and many more liturgical details had become the battleground for the expression of Protestant or Catholic theology. It broke my heart to read of the bloody persecutions of Protestants and Catholics in England, depending on the faith of the monarchy at the time. And I felt relief when I learned about Queen Elizabeth I who allowed for more theological latitude within the Church of England and had that breath captured in the revision of the Book of Common Prayer. One of the more fascinating battles of the English Reformation was over the veneration of the saints and the active suppression of the devotional following Mary had among Christians in England. 
It is with great sadness that I realize through this Marian spirituality course that the reformers desire to affirm Christ's unique place as the sole redeemer led to the suppression of devotion of all the saints, especially Mary, and resulted in largely purging the stories of these just remarkable people from many of the churches that emerged through the Protestant Reformation. As a middle-aged woman, I'm coming to know Mary in her complexity and maturity and to appreciate her spiritual depth and power, mostly through my study of scripture and experiences of prayer. It's been a delightful adventure at times, seeing Michelangelo's Pieta in Rome and worshiping beside stunning stained glass pieces of Mary in churches in this country. All have evoked a deep response. Once the Holy Family appeared to me in a dream as a family riding a city bus. As the mother who cradled her infant on her lap looked up at me, she was identified in the dream by the Greek word theotokos, literally the God bearer. And then the dreamscape became resplendent, shot through with light and enlivened with hymnody. It's one of those dreams where you just don't want to wake up. It was so beautiful. But for those who desire a greater feminine force within their experience of the church or of Christianity as a whole, you may also be delighted to encounter Mary, perhaps again or for the first time. I invite you to discover her for yourself this season and ponder her joy in your heart.